Power Show with Deborah Prinzing. This is episode 599. I'm so happy to introduce you to Susan Chambers of Bloom and Couture, a San Francisco based floral design studio that combines the beauty and aesthetics of a European luxury florist with the relaxed elegance of the California lifestyle. I first met Susan in 2016 at a creative writing workshop in Healdsburg, California. We wrapped up the two-day floral design video and writing sessions when each student sat down with me for a personal interview to share her story. I collected several of those short conversations into a podcast episode that aired in December of 2016, including Susan's segment. So technically, she is a return guest to the Slow Flowers podcast, but I want you to hear the full story today. Seven years have passed, and Susan is running her floral enterprise exactly how she always dreamed of doing. She is featured in my book, Where We Bloom, in the pages of which I describe Susan as a fashionista who offers bespoke floral design. Her unique branding approach connects her clients, many of whom commission multiple floral arrangements for their homes on a weekly basis, with the concept of sustainability and locally grown botanicals. I'm so thrilled to introduce you to Susan today. Our interview takes place in two parts. First, you'll join in as Susan and I chat about her business, her path to flowers, her studio setup, and her aesthetic as a floral designer. That's followed by part two's design demonstration featuring a classic Bloom and Couture seasonal arrangement with the best locally grown flowers available right now from farms up and down the state of California. You're bound to enjoy this dose of floral inspiration as we slowly creep toward the first day of spring. Let's jump right in and meet Susan Chambers and learn all about Bloom and Couture. I'll share our sponsor thank yous after the conversation. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Slow Flowers Show with Deborah Prinzing. This is episode 599. And I am so thrilled to introduce my guest today, Susan Chambers of Bloom and Couture based in San Francisco. Hi, Susan. Hi, Deborah. It's great to see you. It's great to see you too. And um, honestly, I've seen so many photos of, and we've done FaceTime of your space, but I've never actually visited. So we've got to remedy that this year. Exactly. For those of you who um, purchased uh, Where We Bloom or have seen any of the press around it, Um, Susan is featured in a whole chapter in where we bloom and she's in the space that you see right here. And we call this chapter luxury goods. And I think we'll talk about, uh, here's some more interior photos. We'll talk about why we called her chapter about her little tiny flower shop, luxury goods. So, um, you're in that space now, right? I am, and it is um, a bit of a jewel box. It is super tiny. It's only 200 square feet. And it is just, I call it my floral atelier. Right, right. I love that because that fits with the luxury fashion vibe of your business anyway. Um, You hint at that with Bloom and Couture. So we might as well talk about that story first um, because it it brings together everything that you love. So I, um, I started out in high fashion and couture in visual merchandising personal shopping, retail, wholesale, the business end, bringing couture designers back into the U.S. I've done it all and took a, a little hiatus from fashion when I was a, mom, a young mom and took a flower arranging class with um, Dundee Butcher, who at the time had an amazing flower school up in Healdsburg, Russian River Flowers. And I was just smitten it was just it connected to me on a soul level that this was my meditation that working with flowers was a new medium as an artist as a creative and realizing that what i missed in fashion wasn't maybe fashion that it was i love the pace i love the seasons i love the colors i love the texture i love the layering And I found that I could do that with flowers. I could have the seasons, I could have the layers. And I felt like in couture, people took themselves a little too seriously. And so I was (laughs) blooming as an expletive. That (laughs) position of 
lumen and couture, the refinement, the specifics of using the most delicate and beautiful ingredients, right? This ephemeral beauty, what can be more luxurious than the fleeting beauty of a beautiful bloom, right? right. And I kind of sat and thought, where, where, how is this a business that really resonates with me needing in my life? which was putting luxury in. Like we can acquire luxury, we can buy expensive, beautiful things, but what are we doing to refill ourselves, right? I wanted beautiful things around me. I wanted to mm -hmm. put luxury in through beauty, bringing more beauty into our lives, living mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. And I was really fortunate to meet you early on and do a, a wonderful writing workshop with you that could really help me distill down where I saw my vision and what I felt was needing and kind of lacking in floristry in San Francisco. Um, and it was really marrying sustainability um, and kind of my California girl ethos of naturally locally grown and the concept of the refinement of what I learned in London at McQueen's Flower School, what I learned in fashion, what I learned studying film in college, right? Like it's, how can I bring my visual sense, mm -hmm. beauty, um, and share it with the world? Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about studying at McQueen's in London, because I think that's probably where you learned the phrase blooming <laughs> <laughs> from those Brits. <laughs> oh, I, totally. Well, do you know, it's one of my, um, my fair lady, Audrey Hepburn, when she yells at the horse to move, it's blooming, you know, and <laughs> That was, I, I'm such a fan of the old movies. Like if I could go back in time, right? And those Doris Day outfits and Audrey Hepburn outfits, it's the, um, yeah. how can we bring that, that color, right? That color and that vibrancy. And I feel like so much of my work is about color. Yeah. I so rarely work in whites. And even when I do work in whites, it's still a lot of greens, a lot of texture, I never mix white with other colors. I always just do white with green. I think it speaks volumes. Ooh. But with color, I love color on color on color on yeah. color. How can you have something sumptuous yet restraint at the same time? Well, when we first met and started talking about how you wanted to like meld your fashion influences and your fine art background um, with uh, a new kind of floral service and you know, kind of figuring out who you're in San Francisco, you're in this kind of posh area where people are interested in maybe investing in something more luxury. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it, you kind of have evolved because you had this idea, but you didn't have a, a storefront. You were working for private clients, right? You really were like a, I think at one point you told me you were like, you did, you know, private floral design or residential floral design, there was some term that you used that I really liked. Like it was sort of a, <clears throat> you had regular customers who um, commissioned yeah. you to bring them arrangements every week, right? Exactly. We would do their whole home florals. Whole so, home floral. That was it. Wonderful. So it's like almost like hotel living, right? Where we go in and the house manager typically lets us in and coordinates with the time um, for us. And my team comes in it's white glove service we bring all the new arrangements i've gone through originally with the owner of the home measured every room that we think we might at some point have flowers in we mark what the artwork is what the colors are how the family lives preferences what is happening right it's so then somebody can shoot me a text and say we have company arriving and we know which guest rooms need flowers on the nightstand and what color that room is, what the artwork is, so that we measure when we're making an arrangement that it can't go past 11 inches height. Oh right? my goodness. Like everything, it's that we want everything to feel intentional and effortless, but it's very highly planned. Right. Wow. And that's your couture um, approach to floral design, knowing that space. Susan, how did you break into that? Like, did you just start with one customer who you happen to know and then like it's all word of mouth? Because I, your branding is beautiful, but it's not like you're saying, hey, I can come into your home and, and right. do a floral takeover. It's my, I feel like my entire business has been word of mouth. 
I still don't have a sign. We are nine years into Blooming Couture and we still don't have a sign. And we have a, two, a now two gorgeous shop fronts in Russian Hill, which is a very kind of Tony neighborhood in San Francisco. Um, we're just blocks from, if you think of like Knob Hill and the curvy street of Lombard Street, it's just a few blocks away. Um, and we just have set a flower installation um, in front of this shop, but no signage. Mm -hmm. And I doubled my size by having another studio and tripled my staff. And we still don't have the ability to do walk-up retail. We right. just keep up with demand. Um, so I think it really speaks to what we're doing, that people care about where the flowers are coming from. They care about this kind of sumptuous look that we're creating. Um, and they're, they're wanting that in their home. I think too, mm -hmm. post COVID of people still not returning to the office. So many people, even if they're working from home just a couple of days a week, they're wanting weekly flowers. They want to bring flowers in during the shutdown. I went from events being booked, you know, a year in advance to being gone overnight. We said we, I would switch to individual delivery which I'd never offered previously. And within four weeks, we were listed as a top five luxury course for delivery. And that just spoke to me that there was a real need here, right? And right. It's through you were kind of You were kind of ready for it and you just you just turned on a dime and, and implemented it. And that was amazing. And so those, those home clients have found us because they're walking by and I think they were like the bougie nature of no sign it's that <laughs> for service you know um, like if you know you know <laughs> <laughs> totally. and, and, but with that said like i don't want it to be so exclusive that i'm putting people off right, right. um right i really want i so i do offer workshops and classes on the weekends i offer people can purchase private classes with me for a saturday morning um i really want to share kind of the take the mystery away out of luxury floristry of it doesn't have to be complicated to be beautiful right um, all of this is interesting too that you're talking about your customers caring where their flowers come from so let's just be honest you are based in the, the bay area and you do have more access to locally grown flowers than maybe somebody listening from you know i don't know wichita kansas who's going yeah good luck girl i can't do that and we know that it's easier for you, but you're still developing a lot of sources and relationships that you've had to uh, cultivate to to get what you want. Totally. And I, I feel like my, it, it's an embarrassment of riches, right? That we have so much. We have Rapetto, we have Fagoni Farms all in Half Moon Bay. We have beautiful farms up in Petaluma and Santa Rosa, never mind Healdsburg and Sonoma and Napa, right? And going farther north that direction. Plus, we access everything coming from the Central Valley, from Modesto. Oh, my God, the hellebores we're going to use today are just out of this world, and they're from a farm in Modesto. Oh, my goodness. These peach blossoms also just came in yesterday from Modesto. Like, so... We're getting things not just from the typical growing, but so much is coming up from Modesto, so much is coming up from Oxnard and San Diego, right? It's um, it's really wonderful. I primarily work with Torchio Nursery at the San Francisco Flower Mart, and they are exceptional. We're just so busy. I'm unable to go out to farms like I previously did to right. for events where they know what I'm looking for, and they'll pull it. So I'll say, if you get, you know, pull it for me. And this is our backup if you don't, right? If, um, and so when I go in, they'll say, we have things pulled. You can look at it, right? And they know what farm everything is from. Um, and you, you so appreciate that having come out of fashion with being like doing personal uh, fashion shopping for people, right? Like you, you address people and give them a wardrobe to evaluate. You're doing the same thing with flowers. Totally. And the way I look at the way we use fabric that we want it milled in Italy because every designer wants Laura Piana fabric, right? That we want 
to know what farms the hellebores are coming from because they're going to hold better depending where they're from, right? Is this yeah. an established farm? Is who? How are they growing it, right? Mm -hmm. Where are our roses coming from? And oh, they're just in Salinas at Green Valley, you know? Like it's okay. Yeah. This is these are tried and true farmers that really are committed to yeah. this method, and I want to support them. Yeah, and then you're telling your customers. Um, a little bit about the sources if it seems special or relevant, right? So they know. So when we go in for a weekly residential delivery, I'll leave a card that actually says what I left, right? Mm -hmm. So we have butterfly ranunculus in the front entry. We have, you know, hellebores in the kitchen. We have plum branches in the, it's like, so let, let them know because they're not seeing me on a weekly basis. We're just kind of coming in delivering beauty uh -huh. and then we escape as quickly as we arrive <laughs> and know what they have <clears throat> right. right these are flowers they're not going to find at the grocery store they're yeah. not going to find butterfly ranunculus from oxnard at the grocery store or right red tipped hellebores right it's these really special products and that's why they're coming to our luxury floors right mm -hmm. it's for those ingredients that they're not going to find somewhere so serving the residential customer and doing the everyday deliveries kind of saved you when all your events crashed. Have you tiptoed back into events or are you kind of too busy to even do them now? We do a little bit. I've capped that I'll only do three weddings a year. Um, and it's not based on price. It is truly based on, I want to be able to be open to do other things. And I want to resonate with the client. I want them to understand my and value of sustainability um, and that we don't do traditional cookie cutter events. I want to be moved and excited. And I have to say some of the weddings that we take on have the smallest budgets because I love the creativity and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, wow. That's why we're doing this, right? It's yeah. because we truly love what we're doing. And when you meet a couple who is as excited about being green and sustainable and chic and stylish all at the same time, right? It's a, a perfect match. And oh my gosh. Things. You're in your happy place then. <laughs> totally. Can you talk a little bit about some of the um, corporate work you're doing? Um, Cause I know some of it is you have to sign NDAs. <laughs> exactly. So we're doing um, daily flowers for a luxury brand um, downtown in Union square where we go in and switch out the flowers um, and maintain the flowers and greenery um, and it working uh, which I love having been in visual merchandising and luxury goods I really am thrilled working back in luxury brands again um, it's a wonderful partnership we do all of their events as well as send out arrangements to their VIP clients which is just a dream what a um, gift. And then for also the idea that my brand is in front of their clients, right? That my flowers are going out as the thank you of a luxury brand saying, this is the best florist, just like we're the best at what we do. Right. right. And so your, your card is in, in the gift enclosure or whatever. Wow. So, um, I, cause I love fabric, blooming couture ribbon, um, and it, I love how it's stitched. It has like a saddle stitch. I really wanted it. I was so inspired by kind of the old labels of Yves Saint Laurent from the 50s and 60s, right? It's um, really looking back at the old um, couture labels and wanting to mm. always kind of keep that in, that what would be stitched in the suit, right? Um, and so we put our branded ribbon on everything that goes out. Um, which is really wonderful to then people can look back and find our company. It, that saddle stitching reminds me of, of the Hermes um, label too. It, totally. Just in your signature black and white. Exactly. <laughs> and I, we keep everything black and white. The shops are black and white. The packaging, we do white gift boxes with white tissue. Um, so that everything arrives as a gift. A and the, gift. the flowers are the, are the color you know, in the star. Yeah. And our black and white aprons, we hand deliver. We don't do any shipping. Um, mm, 
Hmm. Well, you alluded to the second space. So let's just talk about that. And then I'm going to ask you to start designing for us because I know you have something special to show. The story of this space that you're in is in Where We Bloom. And it's kind of comical. And it's like against all odds, you and your husband like turned this somewhat derelict in retail space into something really nice. Totally. <laughs> so what, how did, it's, is the new space in the same building or on, it's on the same street, right? It is. It's actually the same part of the same building. There's a candy store in between us called the okay. candy store, which is the best candy store in the city. So what can be better than flowers and candy next to each other, especially at Valentine's Day? Oh my gosh. I'm sure you were, it was crazy. And it was a vacant space for the last two years. And I just adored the space. Um, these, this building was rebuilt after the 1906 earthquake. It was a part of a controlled burn to stop the fire coming over the hill during the earthquake because the fire actually did more damage than the earthquake. Wow. In San Francisco. So the old wood floors are from reclaimed from the fire, right? It's wow. Like, this building's been here over a hundred years. So I just love the charm of this. We have 15 foot high ceilings with that are all glass in the front of the window. It looks like a little European shop um, that you could find in Amsterdam or London or Paris. And so to have the second space now is just dedicated production. We are so busy that I wanted to still be able to offer workshops and classes while having production happening at the same time. And in this tiny little atelier, that was this narrow work. space. <laughs> it is ten feet wide. <laughs> you could almost like just touch both walls if your arms were a little longer. <laughs> exactly. So, so the the additional space is oh, where you do production. Your team works over there, and then the workshops take place where we're seeing you now. Or okay, and we've been doing more team building, which is really nice. So corporate clients really wanting to come in, and connect and touch right like and i have it's so funny because they always say i'm not competitive i'm not creative i'm and then they are the most creative bunch and then they want to judge each other so i'm like no we're all this i want you to see the beauty of how everyone's is different and they're like but whose is better we want you to judge it right <laughs> Like, no, I'm not judging. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, let's talk a little bit about the fact that you're on, you're a, a street facing sh a space with no sign. Do people, <laughs> do people press their noses up against the glass and knock and say, can I buy flowers? Or how does that, how do yeah, you manage that? Do. And we, if we're here and we have extra flowers, we're happy to do it. Um, but a lot of times we're running our own deliveries, we're installing events, we're, right, mm -hmm. we're facing to get a huge order out to a corporate client. It's, um, we, I don't honestly know how the small, like, mom and pop flower shop is going to do it. I right. don't know how they offer walk-up retail with high hourly costs. The flower prices have gone up sometimes up to 40% post-COVID. I want to have good flowers. They're expensive. Right? So then the prices are expensive. Like my price out is expensive. I don't know how to reconcile that with retail, right? Yeah. It's a lot of walk up retail, they want a lower price point. Um, and so it's kind of understanding where retail is going, right? I We're bringing in some hard goods outside of floristry. I'm working with a group in London to create bespoke blooming couture candles. We've been working for six months on scent design. They're chemical free, they're vegan, they're soy. It's, they're gonna be gorgeous so that we can start having things in here that aren't so perishable. Right. The, the idea of like buying flowers and hoping somebody stops by to buy them before they, when they're not in their prime, I'd rather have them knowing they're going out in their perfection. Yeah, I think that you're 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 touching on something that's so fascinating about retail and the people who are successful are not just relying on floral sales. They're creating uh, experiences and, you know, kind of community events. And so in your way, you're just saying this it becomes the studio becomes a little bit of an advertising billboard for you, but you you've made it clear that people necess can't necessarily count on walking in. 
Exactly. We have a sign that says by appointment, but mm. we typically have the door open um, where people can pop in and ask questions. If we're here, we have extra flowers. I'm always happy to make yeah. happy to pay for someone, but really to get them in for our workshops. I've really committed this year myself that I want to do more community-based workshops. Mm. Mm -hmm. Donating our time and resources to a really wonderful um, non arts nonprofit foundation gosh, in two weeks, um, called Scrap here in San Francisco. And they reclaim materials that would otherwise go to landfill. And it's a staggering amount that they reclaim. So it's like the perfect place that teachers and moms go to do crafts and activities. So we're doing it on how to use like found materials, how to use old liquor bottles, right? How can you turn unusual vessels into basis like how to set the table with found materials but oh how fun really mixing that high low going back blooming couture right i want to mix that high low make it approachable um and all the money is that's raised for people paying to go take the class is actually going to this nonprofit, mm. um, which puts arts into public education here in san francisco mm. and so that's really wonderful partnering with the community and with brands and creatives um so that we can start doing more community-based workshops of you know how to tablescape or how to write like what can we what do people want to learn that we can teach that we love teaching and doing right? and i love it and people who come into the shop to take a workshop they probably just want to as you said either these team building or private customers they just want to learn more about flowers that have gained confidence probably well, i think so often they just want to do something creative right mm -hmm. Where they're on zoom they're on computers they're at a desk and to stand and touch these beautiful materials right it's just they've escaped for an hour or an hour and a half and how many times people have taken a lesson and then instead of using that to like become florists, they actually end up buying a subscription to do weekly or monthly florals from us to be delivered to them, that they want that gift to keep coming and enriching their lives. I love it. It's a beautiful message to me. Yeah. It's like they still want to take a home, a piece of you more than just the class. They want a piece of, of Bloom and Couture in their home environment all the time. So. Exactly. Well, Susan, I've I've chatted with you much longer than I had planned, but I just love talking to you. I learn so much every time we talk. Could you uh, do a little demo for us and tell us what you're going to make and let us kind of get some some bloom and couture spirit right now? And I'm going to minimize so, the screen so we can uh, see you. So our price points start at um, one twenty five for a petite. So we always want to make it really luxurious. We use chicken wire primarily as our foundation. And then I typically always do three greens with that. So Salal and Camellia here, I already have nestled in. And then we're going to start adding in some gorgeous mint. And the trick with adding mint and geranium in is I always have it in the cooler the night before. So it becomes very firm. So you don't have to worry about it wilting. But I love to have an ingredient that's a bit of a surprise. Um, I feel like people are expected to, when they nuzzle in to get a scent, that they they expect to find roses. Um, they don't always expect to find geranium or mint, right? Right. But they but it's scented, so they're getting that a response when they stick their nose in. Well, good, right? It's that surprise um i want everything to be a little unexpected luxury so just kind of layering in by creating an arrangement with primarily greens first this becomes our foundation we're using greens that have slightly different leaf shape different shades of green and then i'm going to start adding in some gorgeous locally grown garden roses and the scent is just sublime. I wish we could um, have a little. <laughs> so were you, how were, how was the um, rose sourcing for you at Valentine's Day since that was just last week? We, um, we did special order in a lot from um, 
uh, Green Valley um, in Salinas so that we could get our, you know, our David Austins and our Juliets. Um, it, I have to say, it's tricky this time of year, right? So if we could start by having um, a lot of tulips, if really trying to push tulips to people and understand right. what is in season. Yeah. Um, Cause roses are, are a very pricey and very limited. Totally. So yeah. what can we mix those with? I really don't encourage, you know, straight roses this time of year. Can we wait and do that, you know, later in the season when they're abundant? Um, instead, like let's do a $250 arrangement with just tulips, I think is spectacular. Oh, so impactful. Yeah. Right? I, I should stop talking and let you talk about the hellebores you just put in. They're gorgeous. How amazing these are. So oh. that red tip on it is just like it feels like it's been painted right um, oh and the tonal the tonal vibe with the green is like they're they're aging at different paces so they have that watercolor effect of the patina totally and look how much movement this gives immediately um i'm also going to add in a little of the plum branch what really taking from my background and the arts is my total obsession with the Dutch still lifes and the old Dutch masters. Um, I really like to create a bit of a rooster tail on one side um, and have that be a moment. I then will end up adding it being really dramatic and look at these gorgeous tulips coming in. Oh my um, goodness. Yeah, that's straight out of the Dutch paintings, those those parrots. So how can you not like have tulips right now? They're just at their absolute best. We're gonna um kind of really layer them in. I've never heard that term rooster tail, but now I'm never gonna forget it. Right? <laughs> so it's cute. Just, when you think of those old Dutch still lifes. That's what they're doing, right? There's always a feather. There's always something really dramatic happening on one side of the painting. And then look at these amazing butterfly ranunculus that are just coming in. These are a divine. We're putting these like as themselves, by themselves in the most luxurious homes right now because they're just, they last really Ooh, long. They yeah. Take a lot of water. So we do stop back to um, add water at our residential clients. But the clients ne don't necessarily even know what it is. So it's like intriguing to them, right? Totally. And it's just this beautiful, you know, they arrive and the buds are so closed and then they keep opening and keep opening and keep opening and keep opening. And it, it's just this wonderful. And now, oh my gosh, look at the ranunculus mm -hmm. in the sorbet colors are just divine. So these are the regular kind of upright ranunculus. And I'm just going to keep layering these in. And yeah, I see that whole urn or the whole vessel to your left there. That is just exactly. all those colors. And so, and why I'm bringing in orange now with the pinks is because then at the end, we're going to add in these gorgeous um, citrus that we have. Oh so my goodness. Really always playing with fruit. I love the idea of mixing colors, mixing textures. I'm going to quickly start doing it backwards is always a little tricky. I know. Susan, that is not a petite uh, container though, is it? A two, like this would be a $200 arrangement. Okay. And that's, I have to say our most popular size is probably 200 um, and then 350. Oh. Um, would just be like the small, medium, and large kind of yeah, gradation. Yeah. The fair amount in the 650 range and the, um, occasionally in the 800 to the 1200 range. But I have to say that 350, 500, 200 are, this is where they come for those really like substantial, beautiful arrangements, right? Yeah. Drama. Um, and then look at the, the hellebores having this kind of, it's giving that sense that we were talking about earlier, that sumptuous feel, but with restraint, right? Yeah. It's contained. It's. Um, and, and people might, might 
also read it as, well, that is the epitome of spring because it's, I see it in gardens. I, you know, I, I, I see it at the, at the botanical garden. And so, um, but I didn't know they could be, you know, in a, in arrangement. So it's just That's amazing. Good. I, we have, you know, hellebores growing here in San Francisco, that it's one of the, the few flowers that grows along with camellia really beautifully in our foggy city. Um, and I feel like a lot of our neighbors don't even realize that they can pull them from their backyard. Uh, and right. Cut arrangement. Or what about just putting a few stems in a bottle in your kitchen, right? Like how gorgeous that would be. Mm -hmm. um, and how we can take these absolutely amazing blooms and look the anemone right now are just coming in to season. We are just so spoiled with all of this. So we have butterfly ranunculus, two varieties of hellebores, two varieties of garden roses, a lot of different colors of regular upright ranunculus, mint, salal, camellia, and we're just going to keep layering this in. Yeah. And then the anemones. And, then, oh, and that's going to, that violet, right? That's going to give us that pop of color that I really love, that we're really showing off kind of the height of that it's, I always like a dark element and it doesn't have to be moody and brooding, right? Mm -hmm. It could be this violet anemone that's going to open so beautifully, but it's pairing back to the red tip of the hellebore. Susan, do you, I see a lot of metallic containers be, it, around you and behind you. I see some clear vase. Are those sort of your preferred vase palettes or does it depend on um, the home? Well, the, for the home clients, we definitely shop specifically for those clients. Um, so what we do is we buy multiple vases so that we can always be switching out and it looks seamless. So we have identical vases marked for that client. And we'll go to non-traditional sources, right? We'll buy vintage, we'll, you know, buy uh, online at mm -hmm. any shop. We want something that fits that client's home. Um, and so again, it's going back to my fashion sense of personal shopping, right? Right, right. Um, Love it. That's so smart. So basically minimum of two of everything so that when you bring this week's arrangement, you just pop it into where last week's was, take that vase back to the studio and clean it. Exactly. So smart. It's yeah. Labeled, you know, if it's somebody's Christmas vase that we decided that was perfect on there, um, we're going to save that and know that we're going to use that again next Christmas for them. Yeah. That, that was the perfect vase. It was the perfect height. Um, it worked well with that family. And then here, I'm going to start layering in some of the fruit here. So is it, is it on a stake or is a pick or how do you have that? These are just beautiful in that they have a nice little stick that they're naturally on the branch. Oh, right? oh my. And then. They're gorgeous. Oh my gosh. And that kind of is that nod to winter citrus. And uh, but kind of brings it crosses you into spring. I love the cluster of this. And then what I'm gonna do because it's a short stem is I'm actually gonna use good old fashioned floral tape, the green floral, the bowl tape, and I'm gonna tape it to a food skewer. I use mm. two sticks. I'll use any old branch or stick that's in yeah. the studio, um, and I'm just gonna tape that in. Well, you're, then you're getting it at the height you want as well, right? Exactly. And I'm going to make sure it's really secure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I can, that way we can literally use anything that comes in and we're not so reliant on, um, there we go. You know, I remember when a, a long, long ago conversation we had when you were talking about doing a tablescape probably for a small wedding. And you were talking about how the decisions about integrating fruit and, you know, fruit, I think was maybe pomegranates or something plus yeah. can plus candles. Like that was of a piece with the flowers. And it just was this statement um, that needed all these other elements. It wasn't just flowers. Well, and I think that's, what's so great is that the clients who are finding us, right. 
are the ones who are open to those conversations. Mm -hmm. When I say, what about if we do a flat lay of evergreens with winter citrus? Like California Christmas to me is oranges. It's pomegranates, it's persimmons, mm. it's plants, it's nuts in the shell, right? This is, that's Christmas to me because it doesn't get really cold here. We don't, I don't think snow, right? Right, um, right. And roses, right? And so what can we do? What can we do that incorporates and makes winter special? And that was a really popular idea this Christmas was doing flat lays of evergreens and then going in and styling it with pine cones, with citrus. Um, so it didn't specifically feel Christmas, but it felt holiday festive. It felt and winter. Festive, right? I love it. And we did that on reefs as well for our corporate clients of going down to the VC firms on the peninsula and doing these huge, luxurious wreaths of California mixed evergreens. And we wired in fruit, we wired in berries. Then we wired in ornaments, like let's have some fun, right? Like, let's make this really glam. Um, and That's great. That's see, great. We have like a good little, here, a couple more pinks. Oh my gosh. A typical like $200 arrangement. We have the peach blossom. We have the, the oranges, the mandarins tucked in here, still on the branch. We have our parrot tulips. Because tulips extend as they age, right, they're going to continue to grow. I always group them together so that it's very intentional how they're reaching out. I want them to have their own moment together. So you're saying that you accept that they're going to kind of have a gesture beyond the original design, exactly. but the, the client doesn't have to cut them down. They just can go with it. Yeah, exactly. That's that smart. That thought into where they're going. Um, we want to use them to how they naturally, the best version of themselves, right? Um, mm. That there's all this color of movement. I have a slight kind of pinky orange bringing this yellowy orange in, then, you know, accented with the orange over here, tying back. I always want to have something else kind of mimicking. Um, but I really love this kind of, this is a very signature blooming couture with it really exaggerated on one side and fairly rounded, but there's a looseness. It doesn't feel stiff, right? Um, it's, it's not, yeah, it's not formal compact. It's, it's loose and, um, but it has that restraint, like you said, like it would be, um, I don't know, something that you'd see in an entryway or um, for a party. It is no surprise that this would be a beautiful gift, right? There's yeah. a lot of smiling faces when we deliver these. Oh my goodness. Susan, that is stunning. <laughs> I am so excited that you designed for us. And also with all this lush seasonal uh, I mean, I suppose, I suppose after winter, you're so ready for these spring blooms too. <laughs> right? The, oh, the colors coming in, like I can't wait for all the delphinium and all the field flowers to really um, yeah. show their best stuff. This yeah. Yeah. You saved the best for us. Thank you so much. Well, I'm excited to um, uh, get myself down to the Bay Area so I can come play with you and do some fun flower okay. things. <laughs> We could do a workshop together. Oh Our my goodness. We never got to launch the book properly. I know. I'm I'm game. We gotta look at the calendar and see how we can do that. I know, but we are so grateful that you're part of Slow Flowers and that you're really you're talking the talk. And um, you know, you have this very sort of discerning client that I think has always maybe um valued sustainability, but no one's shown them how. And that's that you're the, you're the translator. And I think that's really important. Thank you, Deborah. I Thank really you. am so grateful for you highlighting what I'm doing here in San Francisco with Blooming Couture, as well as always being an amazing mentor. Oh, thank you. This has been so much fun. And we'll um, share the replay video of this at slowflowerspodcast.com uh, next week and including more photos that Susan's going to share uh, all her social places and how you can follow along. And um, I just thank you, Susan. And I didn't make a big deal out of it, but this is our 500th 
consecutive episode of the Slow Flowers podcast. So um, you're helping me uh, really celebrate in style today. I wish I could. Um, well, I'm inspired because I'm going to make an arrangement this week and I'm going to uh, try to e e emulate what you've done because I love every single thing you put in there, including the citrus, which I would never have done. So that is my big takeaway. Thank you. Okay. And thank you. Thank your team too. I know they helped you a lot so that, um, they could handle all the orders while we were talking. So thank you. Take good care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. You will find the replay video of today's episode, plus more photography and other resources that Susan and I discussed in our show notes for episode 599 at slowflowerspodcast.com. Let's thank our sponsors whose financial support brings the Slow Flowers show to you. This show is brought to you by slowflowers.com, the free online directory to more than 850 florists, shops, and studios who design with local, seasonal, and sustainable flowers, and to the farms that grow those blooms. It's the conscious choice for buying and sending flowers. And thank you to our lead sponsor, Farm Girl Flowers. Farm Girl Flowers delivers iconic burlap wrap bouquets and lush, abundant arrangements to customers across the U.S., supporting U.S. flower farms by purchasing more than $10 million of U.S. grown fresh and seasonal flowers and foliage annually. Discover more at farmgirlflowers.com. <clears throat> Thank you to Johnny Selected Seeds, an employee-owned company that provides our industry with the best flower, herb, and vegetable seeds, supplied to farms large and small, and even to backyard cutting gardens like mine. Find the full catalog of flower seeds and bulbs at johnnysseeds.com. Thank you to Mayesh Wholesale Florist. Family-owned since 1978, Mayesh is the premier wedding and event supplier in the U.S., and we're thrilled to partner with Mayesh to promote local and domestic flowers, which they source from farms large and small around the U.S. Learn more at mayesh.com. And thank you to the Gardener's Workshop, which offers a full curriculum of online education for farmer, farmer florists, flower farmers, and florists. Online education is more important than ever, and you'll want to check out the course offerings at thegardenersworkshop.com. The Slow Flowers Show is a member-supported endeavor, and I value our loyal members and supporters. If you're new to our weekly show or our long-running podcast, check out all of our resources at slowflowerssociety.com. I'm Deborah Prinzing, host and producer of The Slow Flowers Show and The Slow Flowers Podcast. And next week, you're invited to join me in putting more slow flowers on the table, one stem, one vase at a time. The content and opinions expressed here are either mine alone or those of my guests alone, independent of any podcast sponsor or other person, company, or organization. Thanks so much for joining us today, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>